All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to True Crime Loser. I hope you're doing well. So, folks, today we're going to talk about Jason Ravsborg, specifically the story that he told investigators over two interrogations and ultimately stuck with. And we're going to look at the story under the lens of, is this believable? Is this even possible? But first, let me set it up. So Jason Rasborg is an attorney general in South Dakota. Attorney general is the highest legal officer for a territory. Six months ago, on September 12th, Jason Ravsborg is at a political dinner event. Whoa, hey, politics. Let's make a bunch of money somehow. And so he's at the political dinner event. Walking down a lonely, desolate, dark highway is another man named Joe Beaver, and he's walking with a flashlight. They said it was a really dark night that night on September 12th, and cars on this specific highway sounds like are few and far between. So you got to think the only light on this lonely highway is Joe Beaver's flashlight bouncing up and down as he's walking. Attorney General Jason leaves the political dinner event and is driving home on the same dark highway and around 10 p.m. tragedy strikes when Attorney General Jason slams into poor Joe Beaver, they think going 67 miles an hour, the force of which sent Joe Beaver's head through the windshield. So his head and face are now in the car. Can you imagine? They think he rode on the car with his head in for like the equivalent of 400 steps. Jason's getting the thing stopped. I can't even imagine. Gets the thing stopped. That's when they think that poor Joe Beaver's head and body came out of and off the car and fell two feet off the road into the ditch where he came to rest. And unforgettably, his eyeglasses that he was wearing came to rest on the seat of attorney generals, of the attorney general. When you're walking down the highway, probably in a, not in a million years did Joe Beaver think, in five minutes I'm going to be dead and my glasses are gonna be in the attorney general's car. So poor Joe, tragic. But that is where the story just gets totally bizarre because attorney general Jason gets out of his car and to this day, he is going with, he never saw anything. He never saw Joe right bef on the way up before he hit him, during where Joe's face is in the car. Afterwards, he says he got out and looked around and he, well, I don't know, I hit something. I don't know where it is. Slowly but surely, he'll start going with it. It has to be a deer, but not right at the beginning. And at that point, he looks at his car, he looks around, somehow he doesn't see poor Joe Beaver two feet off the road in the ditch. Also, Joe Beaver's flashlight came to rest in the grass and it's still on. So you, you got to think it's a dark night and you got a flashlight laying there. It's a little hard to miss. Maybe the headlights of Jason's car are still on and making it so bright in the dark night that you can't see it, but it is weird. And then at that point... Attorney General Jason calls 911, and I got it queued up, so let's listen to it. Well, first, I've done a video on calling 911 on yourself. And what I noticed is when people are calling 911, say someone was killed and I killed them, and I'm calling 911, and I really want to control the narrative that this was self defense, even though it wasn't. I murdered them, but I. You know, I got to call 911 or that's the plan I'm going with and I'm going to try to sell it as self-defense. Usually the person that calls 911 that's trying to sell a different story or control the narrative just a little bit or try to worm out of a little bit of trouble, whatever the way they want to change the story, they end up saying that detail like one or two too many times. So I, oh yeah, did I say it was self-defense? Again, it was self-defense and I think with this 911 call, that detail that he seems to just mention over and over again is that 
whatever he hit was right in the middle of the road. He, he does not, I don't think he does not want the narrative to be that he floated over to the shoulder or that there was anything other than him d- driving directly down the center and something hit him right in the middle of the roadway, right where I was supposed to be. And I think he says that like three or four times on the 911 call. Like, hey, did I say I was in, in the middle and it hit me? It just comes off to me just speculating that that's the detail that and during that 911 call he knew wasn't right but it's like hey well we're here now so i might as well i the tone of the 911 call i think possibly supports attorney general jason's story that just somehow he just missed everything never saw anything never looked because for someone that just slammed into a man and killed him and rode 400 steps with the guy's face in the windshield he is very calm and laughing and uh, i don't know it's if he did know what just happened he is one cold dude but anyway let's check check out the 911 call all right here we go hello Hello. 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 Well, Allie, I'm the Attorney General. Well, Allie, I'm the Attorney General. There's no urgency of, oh, I need help, there's a guy, you know, or it doesn't really even sound like he's nervous, like, oh my gosh, I'm the Attorney General, I just killed a dude, and what well, this is the end of my life as I know it. It's just, hey, Ali, I'm the Attorney General. How you doing? Oh, and I am. I don't know. I hit something. <laughs> I hit something. Okay. By Highmore. Highmore. I was in the middle of the road. He was in the middle of the road. I hit something. It was in the middle of the road. Look at that. Something. I don't know. Okay, give me one second here. Let me get your map. Do you know where you're at? I believe I'm by Highmore. I can, I'm right, I can see the town. Okay. I think that's Highmore. East or west? I just went to it. I am west of Highmore. Okay. Uh, about a mile, pretty fast. Okay. And this is Scott. You and Stride. Stop to say again. And what was your name? Jason. Jason. Brownsburg. Brownsburg. Okay. Okay. You said he got me on the are you injured at all, Jason? I am not, but my car sure as hell is. Uh-oh, are you? My car sure as hell is. Is it right away? I am out of the roadway. I was able to get over, but... Okay. Even that, I was able to get over, insinuating whatever hit me, which wasn't my fault, was in the middle, and then I was able to get over. My it sure hit me. Oh no, okay, do you think it was a deer or something? Did you know it I have no idea. <laughs> so at that point, during the 911 call, do you think it was a deer or something? I have no idea, but by the time a day or two later, he's going with a deer because I guess really that's the only thing that makes sense to support his story. But. At this point, I don't know, I have no idea. And then he texts a friend on the way home going, I got into an accident and uh, I'm all right, but the car's not. And it doesn't say anything about a deer. And at least from my life experience, anybody that hits a deer, when they send the initial text, they put in, I hit a deer, it was crazy, it spun off. All right, it could be. I mean, it was right in the roadway. And- Again, it was right in the roadway. Whatever happened, it was not me accidentally floating over to the shoulder. It was right in the middle. Okay. And were you traveling westbound then? Yes, westbound, okay. back to pier. Okay. Alrighty, well, I will go ahead and let the uh, sheriff... Okay, so kind of a coincidence, but the sheriff's house was so close to where this happened, it was actually visible. So the 911 operator sends the sheriff out. I don't know if we'll ever know what was said, but it seems like that when he got out there, 
I'm sure it was similar to this where he made sure to remind him, hey, I'm the attorney general. I wear a suit with a very official badge right here. It would make Jeremy weak at the knees just to look at it. So I'm sure he immediately said, hey, I'm the attorney general. And I think quickly it just got onto, yeah, I must have hit a deer. So it is mind blowing that a sheriff went out there, looked at the car, talked to him and didn't they didn't look around. So I either, I don't know. It sounds like that Attorney General Jason was able to really just get the narrative to calm, like, I hit a deer, I don't know. And maybe the sheriff didn't see what he wasn't looking for, but the sheriff goes out there and they look at the car and they go, oh, wow, okay. And he asked if, Jason, are you all right? And Jason goes, yes. And then the sheriff goes, Again, probably because he's the attorney general. I don't think anyone else would get this treatment. But the sheriff goes, all right, your car's totaled. We'll go back to my house, which is just right there. I'll give you a car, and you can go the rest of the way home. We'll call a tow truck out and to get the car. And so that's what they do. They go get a new car, and Jason heads home. At some point, a tow truck also comes out there. And again, I guess you're not going to find what you're not looking for. If just in your head, you're a tow truck driver, you're thinking classic deer, let's get this car out of here. But Joe Beaver's body is two feet off the road into the ditch. And his flashlight at this point is still on laying in the grass on a dark night. So... Then he drives home, Jason drives home, he's texting friends, going, I got in an accident, my car's you know, ruined, I'm all right. And he uh, plans to have a colleague come to his house at eight in the morning, the next morning. And they're gonna bring the car back to the sheriff. And according to Jason, they wanna go out there, try to find the deer, try to find, you know, where's the deer? And so, Tim, his colleague, gets to his place at 8 in the morning. They drive back out to the scene. They park. Also, something that comes up in the interrogation is that, you know, the hole in the windshield that his head came through is on this side, and the dent on the hood of the car is on that same side, and the mirror on that same side is off so anyone with half a brain would come out of that car and go whatever we hit is probably on this side because that's all the damage they looked on the other side he said they didn't look on the side that would make sense until the next day so again it's like why who gets out and sees the damage on that side and goes all right let's look way over there how about that i think it'll be way over there oh we looked for five seconds must have been a deer chalk it up so anyway, they get out there and look on the side that they should have looked, or he should have looked the night before. I guess Tim went one way, uh, Jason went the other way, and all of a sudden, pretty soon, right when they get out there, Jason finds the body, old Stephen McDaniel's body. And according to Jason, he brings... Um, Tim over and he goes, Tim, oh my gosh. And if you were to, uh, Jason said in the interrogation that if you were to ask Tim about Jason's reaction to seeing the body, it would be genuine, um, just according to Jason. But then Jason goes, we got to go back to the sheriff's place. So instead of calling 911, they just left Joe's body there again and went to the sheriff's place. The sheriff comes out. He's probably thinking he's just getting his car. The sheriff comes out and they go, we found a body. And the sheriff goes, you're shitting me. And so it's the morning of the day after. Investigators get out there that day and Joe Beaver's flashlight is still on. And then the day after that, they bring in Attorney Gen General Jason for an interrogation. The first one is an hour long and then a month, about a month goes by and they bring him back in for a two hour one. The first hour chunk is pretty much the two investigators letting Jason tell his story and they're writing it down. There's pretty much, if I remember correctly, no pressure because they're waiting. Really what they're waiting for is the toxicology report, which Jason did voluntarily take the tests. 
And then also these days, just as important as the toxicology report is they want his phones. He's got like a business phone and a personal phone. And there's a big 15 minute chunk during the interrogation where they're just very in, okay, that's your phone. All right, is there a passcode? Can we take this for a little bit? So they really want those phones. Something that stuck out to me with the first interrogation is when they ask him, were you drinking? At the politi- you were at the political dinner event. I'm sure everybody was whining and dining, and Jason was very adamant. And he goes, no, I, was, I did not drink at all. I only had a Coca-Cola. I can give you the server's name. I can give you everybody that I was hanging out with. And you can really, even before I knew the results of the toxicology report, just watching that, I believed him. I felt it in my bones that he was telling the truth. He had the confidence. He was doing things with his body that people do when they're telling the truth. He had that attitude of, no, 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 you're not going to mess with me on this one. I was not drinking. No, 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 you're not going to sit there and intimidate me. That's kind of the attitude. The problem is, is when you show that attitude, when you are telling the truth about something, down the road when he's just going i didn't see him i didn't know it was a man it doesn't look like or i was right in the middle i didn't swerve over (laughs) it really you can see it's like all right that looks like him telling the truth and that really doesn't the phones they get all of the data from that and let's see anything on the first one that i wanted to say I think that's it. They got all the phone data. And oh, also in that first one, he paints the picture, which I think is just a little bit too much of a coincidence. Jason paints the picture that as he's driving towards this tragedy on the dark highway that he just coincidentally thought, you know what? I want to get rid of all distractions. I should put my phones away. There's a ball game on the radio. He said he even turned the radio off. He said, I, got, I had some things to think about, and I just wanted, he kept saying, I wanted to eliminate distractions. It's just a little bit of a coincidence that the time that you careen into a poor guy killing him is the, also the time that you thought, you know, I'm going to not be on my phones. I'm going to turn the radio off so I can pay perfect attention and drive smack down the middle of the road where I'm supposed to be, even though I'm about to hit something. And somehow, even though there's no distractions, and according to me, I'm driving down smack dab the middle of the road, somehow I don't see something that I hit that the head of that thing is in the car and then it falls off. I, somehow I didn't see any of that, but... I did want to eliminate all distractions. It just comes off as kind of with the 911 call talking about in the roadway, right in the middle. It just seems too, I don't know, just seems too much of a coincidence to me. So, but anyway, like I said, the first interrogation is only an hour and it ends with, I think, the investigators getting the story all right let's get his story down and let's get all of that phone data and we'll wait for the toxicology report about a month later they bring him back in and the first chunk of the the second interrogation goes similar to the first they're getting the story down one thing i forgot in the first interrogation is they said do you wear eyeglasses and he goes no and they go well we, we found a pair of black eyeglasses in your car and jason goes uh well i'm in the military and i have uh sunglasses and things and uh, it's like a little seed they planted like do you wear eyeglasses because in the second interrogation about 40 minutes in they really crank up the pressure and one of them is how did you not see him jason his head came through your windshield and was in your windshield for a time to the point where his glasses came to rest on your seat, Jason. And so that's a big uh, point of pressure. Like, how do you not see that? It doesn't make sense. You got to explain how, how you didn't see anything. He's it's a dark night. The flashlight is, is bouncing and supposedly you're looking forward, completely undistracted. How didn't you see that? The flashlight is another big point of pressure. And 
all that uh, Jason really can do is he just going, I was trying to eliminate distractions. Or he goes, I didn't know it was a man until the next day. At one point, he credits himself. He's like, I don't mean to credit myself, but I'm the one that found him. And so they turn up the pressure with the flashlight. They say, Joe, it was there. It was on in the grass when we got there. And then that night, we waited for it to get dark, and we took the same flashlight, put it in the same exact spot, and looked around once it was dark, and you couldn't miss it. And I, Jason just going, I, I didn't know it was a man. I didn't know. I, I eliminated distractions. And then the phone records come out and he had said you know i called my dad but i wanted at certain point i had some work to do so you know i eliminated all distractions and that wasn't true so they said you well you were kind of bouncing around on political websites we had you know here here and there and, and he's going yeah all right well yes you know how it is you look at a headline you bounce around he's really trying to downplay it and they go well do you remember looking at an article about biden and china and again just a lot of downplaying yeah you know i bounce around you click a link you look at the headline you don't even read it though and you put it away just so you can drive down the perfectly middle completely undistracted and they go well the biden china article you were on one minute before you called 911. So you got to think after something that horrific, the head in the car, trying to get the thing stopped, you're going to come out, you're going to look at your car, you're going to look around, you're going to scratch your head, probably be about a minute before you called. And he just, you know, there's not much to say about that other than I did, I just, I wasn't doing anything bad. And, um, in the real moment, other than his face came through the windshield. That's a big moment in the interrogation. The other one is when they say, he wasn't, on, he wasn't in the middle. He wasn't walking in the middle of the highway. Who would do that also? And maybe they were bluffing. They said they had witnesses that drove by before it all happened with him on the shoulder. So they're insinuating, Jason, we, we know you, you've drifted over, right? It wasn't in the middle. You were on a Biden China article, checking it out. You floated over and you killed him. And he's just going, I, I didn't know. And so I think I said this at the beginning, the story that he stuck to the whole time, including now, is that somehow the whole thing happened and he never saw anything. He got out of his car. He looked the wrong way. Never saw anything. And um, yeah, and that's his story. And it's, I'm trying to think, it's like, what would he get out of it delaying the inevitable a night? That someone was going to find the body and they were going to, it was, he was going to have to go through this process. So what would he get? buying himself another night i don't know it doesn't seem it doesn't seem worth it to me to try to do all of that um to try to just risk it i guess and go home with it just makes him look horrible and he's an attorney general so you would think he would know and i just honestly don't know what to think about this one i guess there's a chance that somehow he saw nothing and missed everything and just thought it was a deer or or what or maybe the one thing maybe every the all of the deception and the parts that feel weird maybe all of that is simply because he didn't want the charge of him you know drifting over to the shoulder he just if i hit you know if i hit something in the middle it's more their fault than mine maybe the all of the like this does not feel right maybe that's it just right there or maybe like I said, he wanted to buy a night to get something done before the whole process started. I have no idea, but it ends with he was charged with three second-degree misdemeanors. Uh, one, operating a vehicle using an electronic device. There's a careless driving in there, but it's not, it's not going to be too much of a, like a punishment for him. I think he's facing up to 30 days in jail and a small fine. A lot of people in South Dakota wanted much more and felt a little bit weird about this one. 
and officials in South Dakota did a press conference saying in order in South Dakota for it to bump up to like vehicular manslaughter or negligent homicide up to one of those, um, and they had a bunch of su Supreme Court cases that kind of did the same thing, they said he would have had to be driving on the shoulder knowing how dangerous it is to drive in the shoulder and to do it anyway. And But since it was just really a sad accident where it looks like he's on his phone and then accidentally floated over and killed poor Joe Beaver. But there is just parts of this one. I was like, what? You didn't see him? And um, yeah, so I guess that's the story. I'm really curious what you guys think. I'll link both of the interrogations in the description. The second one that's two hours is the one that really gets going, I think about 40 minutes in. But anyway, I'm gonna cut it off there. I love you all, I'll see you soon. Wise, starving wise,